All right, starting in chapter two, we begin our discussion of optics. We're going to look at how light interacts with matter. Sometimes light is absorbed by matter, and sometimes light is reflected off of matter. Um, there are lots of different kinds of light, and some matter goes, some light goes through certain matter that other types of light will bounce off of. Um, we're going to focus primarily on visible light to begin with. Um, so when we talk about light, we'll be talking about visible light. Some of the properties of light, we're going to use the word photons to describe a particle of light. The parentheses, or the quotations there are because particles and waves, those are two different words to describe things. Um, but what light is, is something else entirely. It has properties that are particle-like and it has properties that are wave-like, but it isn't properly described as either. And it behaves differently in certain situations, sometimes like particles, sometimes like waves. So depending on our usage, we may we may talk about either thing. Um, mostly it's um, a packet of energy. It's a, a ripple in the electromagnetic um, field and propagates energy from one place to another that we see as a light. The amount of energy that it propagates is h times the frequency. h is a constant, another universal constant, this one called Planck's constant, after the gentleman who came up with it. Um, and it's probably the smallest number you'll ever encounter. <clears throat> 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds. So it's a very small amount of energy per photon. When you feel the warmth of the sun on you, Many, many Avogadro's number of photons are bumping into you when that happens. So each individual packet of light is very small, but the universe is absolutely just swimming in light. Um, so this energy, uh, we can, this helps us, the Planck's constant helps us um, come to grips with the dual nature of light. <clears throat> interacting both like a particle and like a wave. So it has a frequency like uh, a wave, but it has a, an energy like a particle. Um, and it will have a momentum like a particle as well. <clears throat> so um, there are certain experiments that show us that, that this is true. We've, and the human race has sort of vacillated back and forth between thinking it's a particle and thinking it's a wave. So um, the ancient Greeks thought for sure it was particle-like, and then Isaac Newton came along and proved that it was a wave, and then um, other scientists came along and proved that it was a particle again, and then Albert Einstein came and said, look, here's why it's both, um, and how it can be both, and then quantum mechanics was developed, and we really began to understand the nature of light. We do understand light very well. Of course, there's always more to learn. <clears throat> So depending on your experiment, it will either behave like a wave or a particle. Um, testing both at the same time has, has yet been impossible. It's either behaving like a particle or a wave, depending on how you interact with it. And so um, you really can't seem to test both at the same time. Okay. But what we're going to do, the optics, comes way before the quantum mechanics in terms of the history of this stuff. Our ability to, to bend light and use light um, is pretty old as a, as a species, a few hundred years anyway. So light um, behaves as if it travels in a straight line. Um, if the if the um, material that it's traveling through is homogeneous, if it's the same everywhere, if it doesn't have imperfections. So your room filled with air, the air is nice and evenly spread out everywhere, and so the light will travel in a very straight line through air. When it reaches a different material, it will change its behavior. So let's say the lens in my glasses is also very homogeneous, but has different properties than the air around it. And so when the light reaches my lenses, its path changes. It has um, uh, a bend in its behavior when it reaches that boundary between the two materials. So we're going to focus on that. It's going to hit mirrors or lenses, <clears throat> um, bounce into like go from air to water, that sort of thing. Um, and when we do this, we're going to do a ray approximation. We're going to pretend that there um, is a beam of light, there's sort of light coming everywhere, but each beam of light is a nice straight line uh, interacting between. And when you reach a medium, um, a boundary between two surfaces, that line gets bent. And so this is why it's called geometric optics, because we're dealing with a bunch of angles, a bunch of uh, lines that come together, and two lines that are sort of bent from each other form an angle with each other. And so we'll do a little bit of uh, geometry that way. So what's really happening is there are wave fronts, but the, the waves are traveling 
um, in such a way that they that they have a perpendicular orientation in terms of their motion, and so we can pretend that these are coming in as rays. Now these rays are parallel to each other. That's the important thing. So you have a bunch of wave fronts passing through a point at a certain amplitude. The rays are perpendicular to the wave fronts, but super parallel to each other, and that's the important thing. So you'll have more than one wave, all of them being parallel to each other. This would be from a single source of light. If you have three or four sources of light, um, that complicates the issue. We aren't going to go there, obviously. We'll let bo light bounce off of an object, but we usually pick a point on that object and say, all right, what's the light doing that's coming from that point? And from there you can extrapolate where the light is on, coming from the rest of the object. So let's do some definitions. Let's get a little vocabulary down so that we can talk about what happens. Okay. Um, somebody was asking me the other day what a medium was. Um, a medium is the material with which the object um, travels through, right? So air is a medium for light. Um, this plastic in my lenses can be a medium for light. Glass, water, anything. The thing that the the substance that the light travels through is called its medium. The incident ray is the ray that's coming in before it hits the uh, the boundary surface. When it encounters a boundary. Um, some of the light is reflected back and possibly some of it um, travels through. So some of it bounces backward into the medium that it was about to come into and some of it will be bent through. So um, when light bounces back we call that reflection. When light travels through and bends we call that refraction and we're definitely going to deal with both. So let's say the object is a mirror, it would all bounce back, you would get all ref reflection from that surface. So specular reflection just says that the surface is smooth. When the surface is smooth, you get a nice even reflection. The light coming in and the light coming out all bounce at a nice, um, uh, all bounce at the same angle, right? All these guys are coming off at the same angle from each other. <clears throat> so a mirror is nice and smooth and that gives you specular reflection. Uh, the light is reflected parallel to each other. So we really can't solve a problem that doesn't have specular reflection because you know, you've got a rough surface that's going to be chaotic and go all over the place and there's no answer really coming from it. No single answer for all of the photons together. So this is the only thing that we can do. Um, so if you have diffuse reflection, that means the surface is rough, everything's leaving at a weird angle, it's still bouncing off with the same rules, but because the microscopic, we don't know what's going at, you get, you get lights bouncing off in all different directions and that's what happened here in this picture because it's all going in different directions it doesn't look like it it goes anywhere you just get a, a bright spot there and you're just as likely to go in any at any angle from the the hit and so you spread out all of that energy <clears throat> into all three you know three directions x y and z and it looks weaker than it would be and that's what diffuse means to be to be sort of spread out so we're going to have um, specular reflection, we're going to have a nice um, smooth surface, and that gives us something called the law of reflection. So if you take a normal to the surface, remember normal means perpendicular, so this dotted line here is the normal to the surface. All of the light coming in, um, an incident ray, anything that reflects will do so at um, a, a specific angle. right? Um, so let's say the incident ray is uh, theta 1, and the reflected ray is theta 2, there is a law for that. Here's the law of reflection. The angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection off of a smooth surface. So theta 1 and theta 1 prime are always equal to each other. So why bother? Why do we even bother putting a prime on the thing? Well, for refracted, we're going to get a different uh, story. It's only for reflected. Okay, For refracted, we'll get a different angle, and we'll have to come up with a new law. But <clears throat> for reflected, they're nice and equal to each other. So, comes in, hits the boundary, um, part, of the f part of the ray is reflected and part of it is refracted into it. The part that's refracted into it is bent at the boundary and you get a different angle. So we call that refraction. So here's our refraction. So some of the light coming in reflects at an equal angle, right? Theta 1 equal to theta 1 prime. And some of it reflects, so we're going to call that theta 2. The angle of reflection does not equal the angle of refraction. There is a, um, a bend there. And it depends on the material of these two different uh, substances.
those materials <clears throat> would have different properties. If they had the same properties, then there'd be it wouldn't even there's no boundary there, right? It would just keep going in a nice straight line, um, and then I think yeah, those angles would be equal to each other. But in general, they're not. Or it's trivial if they're not. So let's see if we can come up with a law for that theta two in this new material. So in this picture, we have air and glass. So we're gonna um, bend light or refract light in that glass and make a lens. So here we go. Uh, one is coming in and two is coming out and the angle to that normal incident equals angle of reflection. This guy here bends, right? When it hits this new surface, it reflects, right? Angle of incidence equals angle of, angle of reflection. Then when it comes back out, it rebends um, to the properties of this medium again, you'll notice two and five are parallel to each other because they've had the same bend one way, then there was reflected back and then it was bent the way it was again, sort of in reverse. It comes back to where it started. So one is incident, two is reflected, three is refracted into that material which is called lucite. Then four, you get an internal reflection again on the bottom surface. Maybe some of it goes through to underneath there, but we don't get to see that. Um, and then five is refracted again and becomes parallel again to number two. Just an example of reflection and refraction in a very specific case. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk about that um, difference here. Uh, so the sine of theta one over the sine of theta two so the ratio of the sines of the angles is equal to the ratio of the velocities, but flipped over there, right? So sine of theta one, so what basically V one times sine of theta one is equal to V two of sine of theta, sine of theta two is where that comes from. <clears throat> so when you refract into a material where the speed of light is lower, you get a, a smaller angle, right? So you get an angle that's less than the angle that is uh, incident. So theta one is smaller than theta two if you go into a material where uh, the speed of light is slower. Now, the speed of light is always C, so it's very silly to talk about the speed of light being slower, but when the light is not in a vacuum, it interacts with the air molecules around it. It actually gets absorbed, gets re-emitted, absorbed, re-emitted, absorbed, re-emitted, and that during the time that it's absorbed and before the time it gets re-emitted, there's a certain, a certain delta T there. And in that time, if we add that time to its total path, then it appears to be slower. So the more dense matter is, the more interactions it has, right? And so the more times it gets absorbed, and therefore the slower it goes. So it makes sense that air is about as fast as it will get. Vacuum is the fastest at sea. Air is a little bit faster, a little bit slower than that. But there really you won't find anybody as who, that's an actual material that will be um, faster than, than air. Right? Only a vacuum will be in just by a little bit. So the various materials will really be about their densities more than anything. But also their electrical properties because the light absor gets absorbed by the electrons in the atoms. And so you know, there's some other properties that might make it strange. But we'll just do it by experiment anyway. We'll, we'll say what's the index of refraction of this material. It will tell you how much the light is bent. So now going from glass to air, we're going from a slow to fast. So that will mean the, so this is now the incident ray. This is sort of backwards, the light coming out of it, and this is the refracted ray. So now it'll be bigger, it'll be more away from the normal than it was before. Not a crazy difficult concept, I guess. The actual math there, um, probably, maybe you'll memorize it, maybe you won't. Make sure you have it written down. <clears throat> The light bends away from the normal if you go from a, a, a high index of refraction to a low index of refraction. Okay. Um, so let's define this index of refraction thing. How are we actually going to apply it as a, as a name? So we're going to use a lowercase n for index of refraction. I know we've used n for a million other things, I apologize. Um, it's the speed of light in a vacuum, which is always c, 3 times 10 to the 8, divided by the speed of light in that particular medium, whatever it happens to be. Now, the speed of light in the medium will always be less than c. You can never go faster than c. Not even light can go faster than c. It goes normally at exactly c. So you'll always n will always be a big number bigger than 1. Um, if light is in a vacuum, we could say that the index of refraction is 1. We're actually going to use 1 for air as well, even though it's like 1.0005 or something like that. 
So for a vacuum, N is precisely one because light goes C in a vacuum. Um, 1.00029 for air at standard pressure and temperature, right? If the density of the air gets higher, if the pressure got higher, you would change the index of refraction just by a little bit. But we're going to use one for air. Seldom do you need uh, five significant figures for your answer, right? Um, but all the other materials will be greater than that. Like, for instance, my glasses have a, a particularly high index of refraction to keep them a little bit thinner than they might need to be. I believe it's 1.76, which is m more expensive than most lenses, but I get it for free because I work at lens crafters sometimes. It's good. Um, so N doesn't have any units because it was speed divided by speed, so meters per second over meters per second, and they canceled out, right? Um... So as N increases, the speed of the wave decreases. You slow it down. That's important to remember because some interesting things happen with the frequency, right? So as light goes from one medium to another, its wave-like properties demand that you have as many crests coming in as crests going out. You can't really change the energy of the individual photon. Um... Right? Otherwise, like energy can't be added to it, energy can't be taken away, it's conserved. And so the only thing that is allowed to change um, is the wavelength. The frequency itself can't change. You must have as many wave crests coming in as going out, or where are they coming from? It become, would make it discontinuous. So all it does here is, at the boundary, you change the, the speed at which they're sort of coming in or going out. And so that, that is a function of frequency for us. Um, it turns out the wave speed and the wavelength doesn't change. The wavelength would be um, more a function of color, I guess, than anything else, right? Um, well, that can happen in certain materials. So the wave fronts don't pile up. Oh, the only thing you're allowed to change um, is the wavelength. The frequency must stay the same. Remember that. Write that down. Keep that with you. That's going to become very important in the, in the next few chapters. Okay. So the frequency stays the same, going from one medium to another. Um, velocity is meters per second, right? Distance divided by time. Frequency, if you remember from our periodic motion stuff, is one over seconds. And wavelength is the distance between each crest. Well, that would be a distance, right? So we've got one over time times distance. Sure enough, that's a speed. So when we put the speed of one over the speed of the other, if we keep the frequency the same, then the ratio will be equal to the, the wavelengths, right? So if you have wavelength one over wavelength two, that's proportional to uh, velocity one over velocity two because the frequency hasn't changed. It's the same beam of light. Um, you're not allowed to change the frequency. So by going back to our index of refraction definition, you can do this. C over N1, C over N2... Um, but C is the same for both, and so you get N2 over N1, yes? So for the index of refraction of one, the index of refraction of the other material is related to the change in wavelength. So if you want to know how much the wavelength changes in one material to another, you have to look at how the index of refractions um, work together. And just notice this has a 1 on the top and a 2 on the bottom. This one has a 2 on the top and a 1 on the bottom. These are going to come back to us when we do our sort of get towards quantum mechanics stuff um, a couple of chapters from now, but it's still in this unit. So keep a hold of that. So let's put this into um, set terms with the index of refraction. So we, we had a, f a formula similar to this with the velocities, but we don't want to deal with velocities because we don't want to deal with uh, numbers quite as big as 3 times 10 to the 8. So instead, if we use a number like the index of refraction, we're using like a 1 and a 1.5, these problems become much more simple put into your calculator to get your hands on. And because it's still true, because the speeds are so similar to each other, um, they're just a function of that ratio between the two indexes of, of refraction, we can totally get away with this, right? So theta 1 is the incident angle, and N1 is the incident property. And notice the 1s and 1s are together here. The 2s and 2s are back together there. It becomes a fairly impl uh, impl fairly simple law to remember. This is called Schnell's law. A little funky to pronounce, I guess, in German, I think. Um, so this is our fundamental law of refraction. So the law of reflection was the angle of incidence equal to the angle of reflection. And this is our law of refraction. Right, so keep that handy. 